Welcome to Inspiring Hope with Lois Herman, a leading expert in professional coaching, clinical hypnosis, and energy clearing. Lois is an award-winning author of Chronicles of Hope. She has decades of experience in advanced hypnosis techniques, has conducted highly effective success coaching programs that have helped clients discover ways to achieve success, empower themselves, their families, as well as holistic practitioners to expand their practices. Get ready to be empowered with your host, Lois Herman. And happy spring, everyone. What a wonderful time of year it is. The sun is shining more hours in the day. The weather is warming. The birds are busily making their nests. This is actually the beginning of Holy Week and Passover, two very special times of year in our religious customs. Times of introspection, of prayer and meditation, of remembering the challenging times of our ancestors, of our historical spiritual belief systems, of taking inventory as to what is good in our lives and what we would like to change. In this spring of 2020, most of us are dealing with incredible amounts of stress. The enforced disruption of our lives is very real amidst the intense emotional trauma of this great coronavirus pandemic. This time of global disturbance is very real, and this microscopic bug has stopped us in our tracks and given us reason to pause, to take notice, to slow down, to wake up. This virus is shaking us up, waking us up. The actions we take now in this crisis will affect our future. It's necessary to shift the enormous amount of fear and negativity to a more positive state of awareness and of being. People are experiencing this time of intense stress in a variety of different ways. Some are frustrated at being sequestered at home. Others are worried about finances, of course and many are working their front lines and are completely exhausted. Almost everyone is listening to the pain-filled stories in the media, which serves to exacerbate our fear. There's so much stress taxing our systems, and at this time of social distancing where we can use a really nice hug, we need to share some virtual hugs and smiles to keep our energy positive and our thoughts uplifted. Did you know that a smile will increase your endorphins? And if you smile at someone, it's, it's a contagious thing. You can smile at someone. They almost always like smile. <laughs> Kyle, yes, <laughs> yawn or smile. You can do that at somebody. That'll wake them up. That'll give them a, at least it, it makes you feel like you're being paid attention to, right? Yeah. So even though we feel like this is never going to end, it, it is. It's going gonna, it's gonna to end. We'll get through this. If we take the time to replenish ourselves now, we'll emerge stronger, wiser, and more focused on what is good in our lives. Right now, if we take a moment to focus on the positive in our worlds and take small doses of negative news and to prevent it from becoming destructive to our mind, body, and spirit, when our energy is depleted, our body becomes more vulnerable to sickness of any kind, especially this nasty virus. You are listening to Inspiring Hope with Lois Herman at WSMN 1590. Right now, I'd like you to pause with me for just a moment to take a breath. Put down what you're doing at this moment. Even if you're driving, you still keep your hands on the wheels, you still keep focused, but you can do this with me. Keep your eyes open if you're driving. Take a gentle breath deep into your belly and hold it for a few seconds. And as you exhale, relax. Again, inhale peace deep into your belly and exhale relaxation. As you focus on your breathing, relax your shoulders, your neck, your jaw, and your face. Take a moment anytime you start to feel stressed and just breathe. Notice that muscle in your body that is the most tensed. Breathe into it and ask it to relax. Ask your body what it needs for you to do. And if you pay attention, if you quietly listen, it will tell you. Acknowledge what is needed and make a commitment to yourself to take action, even if it means giving yourself permission to slow down, to breathe, to meditate, to pray. Keep focused if you're driving while you allow your amazing imagination to take you anywhere you wish to go. 
Take a moment to tap into your inner wisdom as you invite your imagination to transport you to a favorite place in nature. It could be the beach with gently rolling waves, the sun shining high overhead against a clear blue sky. It could be a woodland path with the sunlight filtering through the mist of the leaves, with the fresh smell of nature and maybe some small animals scampering about. Or it could be a summer garden filled with glorious flowers in bloom with their vibrant colors and their sweet scents. Notice how simple it is for you to calm your mind and relax your body. Thank you for taking this moment with me. Promise yourself to do so on a regular basis. Give yourself a time out and let that ima imagination transport you wherever you wish to go. Even though you might be quarantined at home, you can take that imagination anywhere. And while you're there, think of the things you are grateful for. A safe place to call home. Food on the table. Beloved family and friends. Our precious pets. The beauty of nature around us. And music to uplift us. Be thankful for our health. And send some positive energy to those who are suffering those who are sick with this virus and their families who feel helpless. The frontline workers who are exhausted and those who are so fearful that it's affecting their peace of mind. Send them a prayer of hope, of light, of love. Invite the blessed energy to come from above and send it on from your heart to those who could use a little positive energy boost right now. You are listening to Inspiring Hope with Lois Herman at WSMN 1590. I'm here every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. I also have a show now at, on Wednesday evenings at 6 o'clock. And as we share with others, it helps to boost our own endorphins, making you feel good physically, mentally, and emotionally. And there are many, many people doing some simple things to help others at this time of challenge. Some are making masks to share with others. Some are shopping for their neighbors or walking their dogs, helping in some way. I'm delighted to see many of my hypnotist peers creating meditations and calming exercises and offering them free on Facebook. Reiki practitioners are sending their energy. Others are meditating and praying for healing. You can find many wonderful calming meditations to listen to online. And you can join groups that are gathering to stay connected. My Chronicles group meets this Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. You can sign up at chroniclesofhope.net community. We can use our technology to our advantage during this situation. Use Zoom or Skype to keep a virtual connection between friends or family. And smile. Share uplifting things. Be there for those who need a hand up. As a hypnotist, I offer Zoom sessions to help clients shift fears and habits to be more positive and production. You can schedule a session easily on the contact page of my website, loisherman.com. And while you're there, read some of the dozens of blogs or click over to my new YouTube channel for all kinds of inspiring videos. I'm here to help you through this challenging time. And please stop for a minute and consider what you are most passionate about in this time of life. What gives you so much joy that you can't not to do it? Many of us have had a multitude of different careers. My first career was really in medicine. I spent 40 years in diagnostics and corporate America. It was a career that I did very well at, but it was a career choice that my father made for me. It was not my choice. And as I matured, I discovered the power of, of the mind with hypnosis in order to help me through my own traumatic experiences. And I, I've had my fair share. But I discovered the power of the mind helped me through that. So then I decided, as I was retiring and moving away from my corporate med medical position, to pursue the power of the mind of hypnosis and helping other people to shift their mindset. So I ended up shifting from one career to a second career. 
And now I'm helping people, helping you, I hope, in my own special way, my own simple way, to shift your mind from that fear-based thought to the thought of hope, of what could be. So while you're sequestered, why don't you investigate what it would be like to do what you really want to do? You want to get Rosemary on the phone? Because we've got a very special guest coming up here soon. And while you're there, think about what you can't not to do. That's one of the things that Anne said a couple weeks ago. And follow that as your passion. That's what happened with me with hypnosis. It was something that I was so fascinated with that I was sharing it with my peers and was amazed with how well it worked. And that turned into a whole new career for me, a career that I love helping people with. So what is it that you can't not to do? What do you love to do? What is your passion? At this time of great uncertainty, we must cherish what brings us joy and give us hope for what we will do when this quarantine comes to an end. Take this time to investigate and get ready. Get ready for a new phase of life. You're listening to Inspiring Hope with Lois Herman at WSMN 1590. And I want to... To introduce my next, my my guest today is a wonderful example of what she can't not do. Her background is intriguing, and her journey has led to a fascinating career as a wildlife explorer who captures the essence of amazing animals in her paintings. Please help me welcome Rosemary Conroy. Hi, Rosemary, are you there? Yes, hi, Lois. Hi, we're, we're doing this um, via phone uh, because we're being mindful in the studio of, of only certain people. I'm honored to be one of those that's allowed to be here, so I'm delighted to have Rosemary on the phone with me. So, Rosemary, tell us a little bit about you and, and your background. Oh, well, thank you again for inviting me to be on your show. Um, so, I like you, I've had a couple of different careers, and my most recent career, what I'm trying to do now is um, what I call being a, wild, a contemporary wildlife artist. And my um, hope is to inspire people with my artwork. I'm a painter, and I really want to connect people with the wild beings around us. So that's mostly what my work is about right now. And you paint huge paintings. I saw your picture. I, I have yet to meet you, and I will someday when all this is over. But you paint like life-size or bigger paintings of big animals. Yes, I, I, just, um, I just love the um, act of painting, and it just, I start out painting kind of small, but it just is so much fun to paint big. <laughs> it's a full-body experience. And you were saying that you had a different career. So those people who are kind of sequestered right now and they're they're struggling because they are not, you know, they've been laid off or, or their business is put on hold. What did you used to do and how did you end up getting into uh, painting wild animals? Well, I always was um, creative and artistic, you know, from the time I was a small child. And I took art lessons as a kid. And that's really what I was passionate about, but my parents um, really didn't see the, uh, I guess, wisdom in it, or they didn't see the practicality of it, so they convinced me that I should get the quote-unquote good job. Yeah. So my first career was in computers. I did tech support for a um, Wall Street firm back in New York City. That's where I grew up. And I tried it. I gave it a shot, but I'm really just not cut out for corporate life. <laughs> I hear you. And yeah, and then one day I just happened to be walking in this park where I never had walked before. I don't even remember why I was there, but obviously I was meant to be there because I ran into this group of people who were bird watching, and they called me over and said, come here, let's come look at this. And so I did, and I they showed me a rose-breasted gross beak, and it was the most amazing thing I had ever seen. I had never seen anything like that before, and it just... It just opened my eyes to this whole world that I sort of, you know, knew about nature a little bit. Uh, We weren't like, you know, I lived in Brooklyn, so it wasn't completely wild there, of course, or wild in a different way. (laughs) Um, But it just led me down this path to learning about birds and then about plants and trees and nature as a whole. And that led me to New Hampshire and then eventually a career in conservation um, 
where I worked for the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forests for over a decade. Wow. That that was a that was quite the change from New York City IT to New Hampshire Protector of the Forest. That's an amazing shift. Yeah, it was wonderful. I mean, it felt I feel like New Hampshire is my home now. I've, I've lived here 30 years and I just, you know, love it. We were comparing notes on that. We both moved up here in the early 90s. So, yes, and this is my home as well after being a, a you know, a confirmed traveler, I'm delighted to call New Hampshire home. It's a beautiful place. Yes, I'm so lucky to live in such a beautiful place. So, and then, go ahead. I was just going to say, so after um, 9-11 happened, I used to work in the World Trade Center, and um, I just kept thinking about all those poor people, you know, who were going to work every day like I used to do, and probably thinking about their some days like I used to do. I used to think, oh, someday I'll get to be an artist, you know, and I just struck me so hard that, wow, there's just no guarantees that you can get that someday. There's, you know, who knows? Now even more, like, life could be really short. So I just decided I had to become an artist. This is what I really feel like I was meant to do. And so I, you know, took a couple years to save up some money, and here I am, I don't know, 15 years later, and I'm I'm doing it. I'm an artist. I'm a professional full-time artist, which is amazing and wonderful. Yes, and, and do you have a website people can go to to see your art? Oh, yes. Um, yes, it's rosemaryconroyart.com. And, and wait till you see this stuff, guys. I mean, she likes to paint big animals. Now, I, I'm, I have this little bird watcher certificate that my, my son gave me because I'm, I'm an avid um, bird watcher. I have a lot of birds in my backyard and bears and some other things, too. But, um, but nothing like what, you know, how Rosemary has really deep dived into this. And um, tell us about what you call your dharma. Well, I, you know, working in the conservation field, I realized very early on that just telling people about all the things that are going wrong in the world isn't terribly effective. And so what I always wanted to do, what I consider my dharma, is to celebrate the beauty, the wonder, the mystery of our natural world. And I just feel like celebration is such an important thing because we all get so caught up in, you know, what's wrong or what's not working. And we forget about the other side, which is to celebrate, take time to appreciate and be grateful for what we have. So I try to fill my paintings with color and vibrancy. And most of my paintings are portraits because I want people to connect with these beings on a personal level. And I think, you know, like when you meet somebody and you look them in the eye, you you connect. And so my paintings are so big because I want people to notice them (laughs) and connect with them. Well, and I'm trying really hard to just capture their spirit more than their, um, it's, my paintings are not um, realistic. I mean, they're sort of realistic, but they're not super realistic, because that's not the point of my paintings. You're capturing their spirit. And, and the interesting thing, you told me that you actually meet these animals in the wild. Like, we're talking grizzly bears and polar bears. You've, um, this is not just look at a picture and paint them, you've actually experienced their energy. Yeah, that's been very important to me. Um, and, you know, when I first started, I would go to local like wildlife rehab places or zoos or, you know, places like that. And I just, um, the energy of captive animals is really different. Sure. And they're still, I so appreciate them, you know, what we call, we call them ambassadors for their species because, you know, they're, they're, They've somehow agreed to be in captivity so that we can see them and, you know, understand what they look like and things like that. But um, I had the chance to go out to Minnesota and meet Dr. Lynn Rogers, who's a wonderful black bear biologist. Um, And he took me out in the woods, and we got to hang out with black bears. And it was just so amazing to see wild black bears. And he had sort of befriended these bears as... um, that's, it's a long story, but let's just say he's, you know, the bears trust him. Sure. And he's able to take people out. And it was just so different and so captivating. And to look bears in the eye, to look bears in the eye when they're in captivity is really different than looking a bear in the eye that's wild. 
Sure. It's and kind of like the way people are feeling right now being captive in their house versus exactly. if they're out free to dance and, and play and do whatever they want out. To, and, you know, there's a different energy, a different spirit. And what we're trying to do with this show with Inspiring Hope is to bring that energy to the people who are captive right now. And yeah. I think I find that fascinating that you've been able to identify the difference in the energy, the essence of the animals whether they're in captive or whether they're in the wild. I love that. Yeah, and so I think it makes a difference in my paintings. I've gone on to see, study polar bears in the wild and grizzly bears in the wild and most recently whales. Um, you know, And, of course, birds. I've spent a lot of time in the field with birds, and I spend a lot of time in the field just period <laughs> you know, around here. I just, that's, my, that's where I find calm and yeah. just being outside in nature. Now, have you spent much time with the bears in New Hampshire? You know, I have a couple of bears that come and visit my bird feeders because I'm remiss at not taking them down. Um, and I love watching them. So, I, of course, they destroy the bird feeder. But <laughs> right. Do you have some bears that you follow here in New Hampshire? I know there are bears living around me. Mm-hmm. I have a dog who doesn't like having oh, bears around yes. me, so uh-huh. she kind of keeps them at bay. But yeah. I kind of know where some of them are, and, mm-hmm. but I, I do go out with her often, so... We don't encounter them very much, which is fine. Yeah. <laughs> better for them and yeah. for my dog. So you said you see yourself kind of as a record keeper. So you're capturing their essence and sharing that with those of us who are not brave enough <laughs> or have the opportunity to go out and truly experience these animals in the wild. Yes. I, yeah, I've been very lucky. I feel very blessed to have had these opportunities. I know not everybody can do that. Yeah. But it feels important. That this, you know, this is my my path. But, so, so yeah, the, the, the record keeper. I, I, you know, as I've been painting animals, I realize more and more that what I'm doing is thanking them for being part of our world. Oh yes. And many of my paintings include my words of gratitude. Literally, I embed words of gratitude into my paintings. My um, hopes for them. My, you know, protective words. I mean, whatever I can think of, I, I put in some layer in the painting. I, I'm getting chills on that. That just says, that just thrills my heart. And and my, my good friend Denise did that when she was painting her room. And you, the two of you know each other. But she had told me that she was going through an emotional time and she painted and she wrote all these positive affirmations on the walls before she painted. So she basically just filled her room with gratitude and positive. So uh, that's delightful that you do a similar thing. Yeah. So you were talking about I want to, I'm intrigued by the grizzly bears. What did you experience with the grizzly bears? Oh, we went up to British Columbia and uh, got to spend some time with these bears during the salmon run, uh, which is when the, it is safe to go see grizzly bears up close because they're you know they're just very focused on putting on weight for the winter. They have long deep winters up there. Yeah, and it was um, it was it was really. Intense. I mean, bears, grizzly bears are intense, but they're, um, they have such strong protective energy. You know, we spent some time with this mother and her two yearling cubs, and, you know, and they were very focused on eating, and as long as we were respectful and gave them space, she was okay sure. with us being there. Wow. But um, they're, they're, you know, I think they're, we portray them in our culture as being these fierce, mindless, you know, antagonistic animals. And I don't, they're not. You yeah. know, most bears don't want anything to do with us. They're not out to get us. No. Um, they just want to live their lives like we do. Mm-hmm. And, but they're very, you know, they're very fierce mothers. You know, they're very protective of sure. their babies. Yeah. And, you know, if they feel threatened, they're going to let you know it. Again, Luckily, it speaks this one to, did not. <laughs> yes. And it speaks to our perception. So so we have been painted this perception that bears are, are, you know, out to get us. And so then that becomes our belief system, and then that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. When we can step back and see another, be it a bear, another human, or another animal, from a place of acceptance and kindness and love, we can truly see that the other person, the other being, the other bear, is truly just trying to exist. Yeah, I mean, we are part of nature, you know, humans are kind of taught that we're separate from nature or nature isn't like us, but it is. It's, we are exactly the same as a bear. You know, they're trying to live their lives, raise their families, get food, um, you know, 
just live in peace and um, so are, you know, just like people. That's right. And um, you're listening to Rosemary Conroy on the Inspiring Hope show with Lois Herman, and this is WSMN 1590. And Rosemary is a wildlife artist who has a passion for capturing the spirit of animals in her big paintings, gorgeous paintings. So you, uh, your latest passion has been the whales. So tell us a little bit more about the whales. Oh, the whales. The whales are just so wonderful and beautiful and I've been so lucky in the last couple of years to be able to go down um, for a week every winter to study humpback whales on their breeding grounds and it's just the most amazing experience. I, I've i spent like the, you know, my pretty much most of my adult life to date on terrestrial animals and to all of a sudden be given this passport to the ocean through a whale has been just magic. I mean, it's really Whales are magic. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I've been able to go down there and spend a week on the ocean, and actually we've been able to snorkel with humpback mamas and babies, and uh, it's just to have a whale look you in the eye, and to see their intelligence, and to feel their energy has just been, has changed my life, really. I can only imagine. I um, I went to Maui for the first time in uh, last June, and we went. Um, we were there. It was a, We just lived kind of a simple existence, nothing fancy. But we went to their new aquarium. Well, the aquarium's been there, but they had a new whale exhibit. And they had filmed all of the whales in that region. And it was, you know, you could see these life-sized videos of whales. And it was amazing, truly amazing. And what they talked about, and you can uh, you can speak to this even more so than I, but I was fascinated by the fact that they referred to Alaska as the whale's kitchen. And then the whales would come down that the underground um, mountain range underneath the Pacific to Maui in the winter time to breed. So if you wanted to see the whales, they were, you know, we were there in, in summer. So the whales were all up at the kitchen eating. And then they would come down to breed. And they typically, they told us, if you want to see the whales, you would need to be here between um, Thanksgiving and Easter. And that you would be able to look out and watch them breaching and right there off of Maui they called it the whale's bedroom (laughs) so there would be like four males to each female and they would be showing off and they said it was just spectacular and I was telling you about that and you said well that's exactly the same thing that happens where you go yeah I mean basically all over the world there are populations of humpback whales and they all follow the same pattern so they go north in the um, summer to to eat where when there's to the colder waters where there's more fish, and then they go down to the warmer waters, um, like in the Dominican Republic, which is where I went. Um, And these are the the whales that we see on whale watches in the summer here. They go down to the Dominican Republic um, to a place called the Silver Bank, and that's where they breed, and then they go back a year later to give birth. So there's whales who are dancing and mating and doing all their romantic things, (laughs) and then there's mamas and babies um, because it's warm water and it's safe and um, it's really beautiful. Like every mama has what they call an escort, and mm-hmm. it's just a male whale who kind of hangs out with her and kind of helps protect the baby. And it's just, I don't know, whales are just, they have such a beautiful culture. That's fascinating. So it's not necessarily the mate, it's an escort. Well, yeah. I mean, this is what we call them. Mm. Um, escort is an interesting choice of words. <laughs> But um, some people think, you know, he's hoping to build up goodwill and she'll mate with him next time. Ah. Or maybe he's related to her. We have no way of knowing. Maybe it's a big brother. Maybe Mm. her son. Maybe who knows. Is there any any way of knowing if it it truly was her mate? Um, Well, I don't think science has caught up Ah. that level of analysis. But I could be wrong. Okay. But, But so it doesn't seem to be that people know for sure. And you talked about the noise pollution for the whales. They they have such an acute sense of hearing. You you exp- you express some information about that. Yeah, whales communicate by making sounds underwater. And as you know, water is a wonderful medium for transmitting sound. Like whales will communicate, you know, across thousands of miles even, um, and they can pick up signals from other whales in the area. Like the whale song. Um, 
Males will sting, and usually around the breeding time, so they think it's related to breeding. But other people think it's just the whales reciting their history for all the baby whales to learn. Interesting. So there's different ideas, which I love that idea of the mm-hmm. oral history. <laughs> and so the whales singing is very important for their culture. Like they share this, like all the whales in one ocean basin will be singing the same song. They all share the song. And sometimes people, sometimes whales will uh, introduce a new phrase and then they all adopt that phrase. And it's that's just amazing that they do that. But the problem is, we as humans have been, you know, our ship traffic has just increased exponentially over the years. You know, all those things we order on Amazon mostly come on container ships, and those are loud. Like we were underwater snorkeling, and you could hear just little motorboats so loud, and you can't even imagine what a container ship must sound like. And it's interfering with the whale's ability to, to communicate with each other. I mean, it's just sort of like birds here. Birds are having trouble. Birds in cities have to sing louder than their birds who sing in country because there's so much extra noise that they That's have to interesting. with. That's interesting. Yeah, and my, my background in, in early ultrasound, I did a lot of obstetric ultrasound. And, of course, babies are floating in amniotic fluid. And we would observe that when we would be, we were using ultrasound, sound waves, and when we would hover over the baby's head, which is where we would go in order to make specific measurements to, to date the fetus, the babies, after, if we were there a little too long, they would you would see them bring their hands up and cover their ears, yeah. or they would turn their heads away, like, oh, this is hurting. And there were points in time where we would use a a stethoscope to listen for the baby's heartbeat. And when you'd place the stethoscope on, it was amplified. The If you had the stethoscope on at the same time as the ultrasound beam, it, it was like this high pitch that the baby was hearing. It was very interesting how amplified sound is through water of any sort. So, of course, in the ocean, they're all, all of these animals are sensing water. That's part of the... Um, Frequency, the um, sonar is a big um, part of how they communicate. And so it, it only makes sense that our noise pollution, where we have air pollution here, we also have noise pollution in the air on land, but I can only imagine that it's truly affecting our animals in the oceans as well. Yes, because it's not just a sound, like we perceive it as sound, but it's also a pulse, you know, it's something you feel. Right. So I imagine that they're being bombarded by these sound waves all the time. Yes, and if you th- if you throw a pebble into a pond, it's just one little pebble, but this ripple effect goes out across the whole pond. Yeah. So that one little action creates multiple reactions. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's a lot of people who are working to figure out ways to minimize that, um, but it is still quite a problem. Is there anything that can be done about these big ocean liners? And, and I mean, right now, everybody is, is um, staying put except for Amazon, I think. Mm-hmm. None of the, the cruise ships are not out. Um, but I'm wondering if that might be helping. I know that with everybody staying put, the, the dolphins are now swimming in Venice for the first time in decades. And the, the air pollution has cleared in many cities. I'm wondering also if without all of this ocean traffic, if it's actually a, a means or a side effect is helping our animals. I imagine it probably is because I know even right now the um, humpbacks are leaving their breeding grounds and they're heading north. And um, I just I have a friend who's in Bermuda and he's starting to see them come past Bermuda. So it's a you know it's an epic journey. They take their little babies on to go. You know, travel thousands of miles back up north, and I'm sure it's just fraught with peril. Sure. I mean, there are um, there are certain shipping lanes, you know, but they, whales don't know about shipping lanes. You know, they go where the food is. So mm-hmm. if the food shifts, they shift, and mm-hmm. we don't necessarily keep up with their shift all the time. But there are lots of really good organizations and people who are very devoted to this. Um, but it is, I wish our government was a little more devoted to it as well. Yeah, you said something about the seismic testing for oil causes some issues with the whales as well, and other animals. Oh, yeah, that's that's really, I mean, it's like setting off bombs underwater. And, I mean, they're, they're actually literally exploding things underwater to test for oil and, sh- and whatever they test for. But um, those have 
horrible effects on animals who rely on hearing for, you know, communication and for navigation. I mean, a lot of whales use echolocation just like that, and um, it's extremely disruptive. And, um, yeah, I really, I hope we rethink our obsession with oil and fossil fuels a little bit and think about the impact that that kind of development has. We know what kind of impact it has. It's very obvious. Right. Um, so. You said that even you know whales that are beached, um, that it could be because they're they've lost their tracking, their navigation system. Maybe their hearing or whatever has been damaged because of an explosion. Yeah, there's a lot of links showing that it's probably the case. Wow. Of course, other people deny, but um, it's pretty obvious. Yeah, something worth considering because you said that. We can hear in New England. We can hear whales that are up in Iceland, or the opposite, or the other way around. Is that correct? Yes, there's some. You know, blue whales are the, the largest whale, the largest mammal on this planet, and they're often up in polar regions, like up by Iceland. And people down here in Boston and the Cape can have perceived their sounds. They have the very, you know, deep um, sound that we can barely hear with our hearing, mm-hmm. but um, they have been able hear them communicating from that far distance. Wow. So and it's, and it's really important as a whale, you know, you're in this giant ocean, you know, it's a, right. to find each other. You can't do it visually. Yeah. So they do it um, you know, with, with, with sound. sound. Yeah. If they can't find each other, then they can't make more whales. And I know I I, I tell the story I had a client that came to me once that wanted to communicate with bees. And when she spoke with the drone bee, again, this is using hypnosis, you can tap into uh, and connect with any number of um, energies if you quiet your mind enough. So the drone bee said that the problem with the chemicals is that it causes them to be confused because they have their tracking system and it makes it, it's as if it makes them drunk. They can't then find their way back home to the nest or to the hive. So it, it, it interferes. So it's interesting how some of what we are doing as humans are indirectly and directly affecting animals and we just don't realize how the impact that we have. And then she also spoke with Queen Bee, who was a little annoyed with the square hives because she said they weren't natural. Their natural shape is actually um, a hexagon and or round. I mean, they, they will build a hive in a hollow in a tree. That is their na- nature. And the square hive c- causes stress to those in the hive. And, and that was disturbing to her. And then also the other thing she was quite annoyed with her humans was the fact that they stole her honey. She's happy to share some, but they need the honey as insulation against the cold weather and for their own food to survive. So if we don't have bees, we don't have trees, we don't have vegetables. I mean, they, they are the ones that pollinate, that keep our crops and all of nature going. But it was a fascinating journey. So I'm considering that you are the whale communicator at this point. <laughs> I'd love to be. I really think they have a lot to we can learn so much from them. Yeah, we could. I guess, yeah, one way I think could be, um, we could understand it as a metaphor would be if the internet shut down, you know, it's sort of like the whales can't hear each other. If we didn't have the internet, we wouldn't be able to communicate with each other. I mean, how everybody is communicating so intensely right now through, right. You know, through the internet, and if that was gone, we would be really lost. Our well, there are those apart. that have, have learned how to communicate telepathically, but that's another story for another day. <laughs> yeah, I'm just talking average. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe we will get to that point someday. I do know people who have those abilities that they have developed over time, and maybe we need to get back to that, to really connect with one another. You are listening to Inspiring Hope with Lois Herman at WSMN 1590. And I'm speaking with Rosemary Conroy, and she's telling us about her passion for the wild animals and how we as humans have a responsibility to take care of them because they they live on our planet and all, the things that we do affect them, interfere with their quality of life, which also interferes with our quality of life. So, Rosemary, how do you make a difference for yourself and others? What, what do you see yourself, your role as? Well, I think I... Part of my role is to remind people of our connection, you know, our wild kinship, as some people are calling it now, that 
we are connected. We are all part of the same planet. Just like we're all connected as humans, we're all, we're connected to nature. We are nature. We're just another expression. Like the animals are an expression. The plants and the trees are an expression of you know of this wild world we live in. And I'm hoping that I can you know through celebrating them through my art, my writing, and other things that I can help people rem- remember that thread that we all share, that we're all connected through. Because, I, you know, I know people, I know some people really feel it strongly. I mean, there's people who see my paintings and respond so strongly to them. But, you know, I see it in how people are connected to their pets and how people get, you know, um, a good feelings from just taking care of houseplants or going for a walk because that's our connection to nature being expressed. That's our, we're vibing with, you know, this home energy, I like to call it. I think it's just sort of part of who we all are. But our culture has disconnected us so much from that. And we've been taught that nature is something that we don't really need to care about or worry about, um, that there's, you know, the GDP is way more important. And I'm hoping we have time now to really think about that we can if that's true. Exactly. And I, I know that there have been experiments where um, <clears throat> you take two house plants and one of them you are, you, this, you can definitely do the experience with food and water. Of course, if you hold, withhold water, the house plant will die. But in this experiment, you would say nasty things to it. I hate you. You're ugly. You're terrible. And there's the second, the other plant, you say, oh, you're beautiful. I love you. I'm here to take care of you. And one will thrive and the other will wilt just because of the energy expressed, just because of the intention that we share. And this is what our, our, on a very small scale, what our planet is feeling when we ignore it, when we, when we are, don't take the time to, t- to pay attention and to nurture what is ours to truly um, be good stewards of. Yes. Yes. Yes, there's just so much... Um intelligence out there we think you know we have one kind of intelligence and everybody if they don't measure up to our kind of intelligence they're not intelligent but there are so many ways of being and um, we're just starting to uncover them and it's fascinating i think it's wonderful i i think that i have actually been told that humans are not necessarily the the most intelligent species (laughs) Um, I think whales might be more intelligent um, in, in, in many aspects. I've heard that they are the record keepers. They are the ones that are the historians. And, and as you're saying, maybe what they're saying, you know, they're, they're sharing the history, much like Native American and other indigenous cultures share lore via, via uh, verbal stories and, and chants and songs. And, and um, that's how they share history without the writing and i'm wondering if you said that there's a new one of them will pick up a new um song and i wonder if they're saying you know they're singing well there's this virus and the humans are all earthbound and that's why we have freedom now (laughs) maybe they're giving you know they're sharing with one another the latest and greatest news that's out there so that then they can it adds to the story the history of our world yeah i think um Whales have a lot of healing energy. A lot of people believe that they are very healing. And um, if we could pay attention to that, maybe they can help heal us as well as we healing them. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. and Ocean. Yeah, our ocean. We, where would we be without our ocean and our coral reefs and all of those that we need to be so mindful of as well? Yeah, it's a big world. So... Who has inspired you in your past, or what inspires you now? How, what do you do, especially in this wake of everybody of having to stay home and not being able to get out there as much? What do you do or recommend to others to do to inspire themselves? Um, well, there's so many things, but for me, I've been trying to practice this for many years now, but now it's more important than ever to be very mindful about what I feed myself. Um, you know, what kind of things do I take in, whether it's food or exercise, but also news and um, movies and, you know, I can't watch violent things, for one, Mm -hmm. and, you know, there's a, um, I think we talked about this, there's a Cherokee myth or legend or lore, I'm not sure what it is exactly, about the two 
two wolves inside us, and one is fear and anger and hatred and many negative emotions, and the other one is love and peace and joy. And the one, and they're always fighting with each other. We all have this fighting going on inside of us. And the one that wins is the one that we feed. That's right. So I try to feed myself beauty and calmness and peace. And yes, you know, you have to pay attention to the news somewhat, but to be mindful of how much you're doing and what kind of news. And um, it's easy to go down those rabbit holes and then just, I mean, you're agitated after reading. All exactly, that stuff. it affects so. it, it affects our vibrational energy. And yes, you're sure. exactly right. Feeding is not just the food we eat, the water we drink. It is the messages we take in and the mind talk that we give ourselves. Do, do you know that there is actually a good news channel out there? That's part of why I started this yeah. radio yeah. show yeah. back sure. in December because I, all I was hearing was negative, negative, and I wanted to have an opportunity to highlight, to spotlight the good people because I know so many good people and then I'm even meeting (laughs) more wonderful people like yourself and I want to shine the light on all that's good in our world because if we can do that we can hopefully shift people to take in to feed on um, good things and there there's a good news channel out there which is kind of cool oh yeah well thank you for doing this it's really a wonderful service and there's many good news channels and it's also I mean just to remember that the news is only one perspective you know, there's many good things happening in the world. Yes, there are. You can choose to pay. You can choose what you pay attention to. The things that are bad and wrong, or the things that are good and hopeful, just like you're doing. Yeah, you. and, and it's the same with with what we watch on TV. There are so oh, sure. many, uh, you know, movies and our TV shows that are that are based on cruelty and and. Um, murder and anger and hate and it's like why why do I want to watch that you know of course I get a a little Hallmark it's a little bit over the top (laughs) but I do enjoy (laughs) you know I can take a little you know my husband and he's like there's a plot every single one has the same plot but um I love to watch the wildlife channels, Nova, and some of nature. Those are my those are my go tos. They're yeah. so amazing. And yes, there's, you know, there's the battle of the, you know, the the. There's definitely watching another animal eat another animal, just kind of oh. But that is the that is nature. I mean, the whole concept of reintroducing wolves into Yellowstone, where back when Yellowstone Park was originally founded, they removed the wolves they, they, um, because they were afraid of, of the people being encountering wolves, etc. But it completely changed the landscape. Yeah. And the uh, elk started overbreeding, and then there was just, you know, ended up with erosion. And since they reintroduced the wolves back in, I think it was the early 90s, that now um, the elk of the population has con- been controlled. The coyotes are no longer devouring all the antelopes. You know, there's just the um, plants are coming back, the birds, everything is back into its natural condition. And when we start interfering because we think we know best, um, we end up with a problem. Well, I want to, um, that's true, yes. But it also, humans can be helpful, too, to nature. There's so many stories of resilience in nature. And I think that's important to know, too, that, you know, like, we we can do positive things for nature. We, there's so many success stories, you know, like, you know, when we passed the Clean Water Act, you know, we the lakes used to, the rivers used to catch on fire. They were so polluted. And exactly. now people can swim in the Charles. Mm-hmm. Um, so that we can pass good legislation and protect, you know, keep it from being undermined. Exactly. As it's being done now. Um, you know, we can clean the air. We can stop whaling, and the whale numbers have gone back. I mean, we almost lost humpback whales. They mm-hmm. were down to like 3,000 individuals in the Atlantic. Wow. And now it's up to 25,000. So we can make positive differences, not just <coughs> negative differences. You know, well, the positive can, differences, I think, are to correct the negative differences and the indifference from the past. <laughs> yes, yes. We can recognize that and change things so that we can allow nature, because nature will right herself. Mother, Mother Nature Gaia, she can heal herself if we just let her, if we don't interfere and interrupt with her natural ability to, um, to heal her beautiful, her beautiful planet. 
You are listening to Inspiring Hope with Lois Herman. I'm here every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, and I feature a different guest each week who, in their own way, is bringing inspiration and and joy and just amazing, amazing positive energy to our world in their own different ways. And I'm speaking with Rosemary Conroy, and I want to call you a wildlife artist because you're not just painting house pets. You maybe do that, but the paintings that I've seen are just amazing, you know, big, beautiful animals. And are there any special messages or events that you would like people to know of? Oh, well, you know, with the way the world is right now, um, everything has been postponed. It's a little, it's just is what it is, I guess. I mm-hmm. don't have, I have, I had a whole bunch of things planned for the spring that have been postponed to summer, and we'll see if that happens. Um, but people can go to my website and sign up for um, updates. I send out updates about what I'm doing. And um, I'm going to have, hopefully, a grand opening. I have a new studio in Francistown. Nice. Part of the Village Store. Um, I have a cute little new studio over there, and I'm just I'm eager to open it up and have people come, but not yet. <laughs> I love Francistown. I used to go contra dancing there once upon a time. <laughs> it's such um, a sweet town. I just, I'm so happy to be part of it. It is. It's, it's a great, a great little town. People. Yeah. So what would you suggest to others to stay upbeat and inspired right now? Well, um, you know, one thing I try to do every day is write down what I'm grateful for, yeah. um, just to focus on all the gifts of my life, which are so many. And yes, there are, it's not to say that there aren't things that are wrong and going badly, but if you can focus your energy on what's good, it attracts more good. I sincerely believe that. And there's something about the act of writing it down with a piece of paper and a pen, and um, it's just become part of my morning ritual with my coffee. I just sit down and write, you know, a list of all the things that I'm grateful for. And um, I just, I have so much to be grateful for. So I, I, I really, I advocate that practice. Yes, gratitude Honestly. journals are wonderful. And then there are times when you, you're starting to feel a little down or, or f- you know, the fear starts to creep in. You can open up that gratitude journal and reconnect with all that yeah. you are, you've already established a sense of gratitude for. And it shifts your energy to be more positive. That's a great, great suggestion. Yeah, and just, you know, it's spring right now and there's so much happening out in the natural world. Like the birds are returning and if you go out in the morning, they're singing Yes. And the peepers are peeping now, and the wood frogs are quacking, and um, flowers are starting to poke up. And mm-hmm. I love spring so much. I'm so glad we that's, have to be trapped at home. At least we can be trapped at home. That's right. During this time of year where we can sit outside, hopefully, and just listen and smell and hear. <laughs> I think that's one of the things that I've noticed about living in New England, because I'm, I'm not a native. This is my home now. But because we live through so many months of cold and snow, when spring starts to come, I cherish every bud on the tree, every bird, every little flower that's popping up. It's just like, oh, look, 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 here are the crocuses, here are the daffodils coming. It's, it, it, there's just this sense of gratitude and appreciation. Yeah, pretty sure that's why Easter happens. This yes, time. exactly. Now, you had a poem that you wanted to read. Can you? We have we have one minute before we okay. leave. Do you have time? Sure. Oh, sure. no, we're, we're fading off. Oh. We can go to your website. Mention your website again, rosemaryconroyart.com. rosemaryconroyart.com. And this is Lois Herman, and you can find me at loisherman.com. I hope you're with me every week. And I hope you were inspired by what you heard today. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, listeners. And we will see you or hear you next time. Meanwhile, look up, stay positive, and be the light in someone's day.